What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 84, and I am the host, Kyle Anslone. On today's show, I have a roundtable discussion I co-hosted with the Around the Empire podcast. So it's myself, Joanne Leone, and Kelly Lane, uh, of again, co-host of the Around the Empire podcast, with Angela McArdle, who's running for LP uh, National Chair in 2022. We talk about uh, a broad anti-war and anti-lockdown coalition and how to advance the cause and, and fight for liberty and freedom. So I think this is a really interesting conversation with a group of people who have uh, different political viewpoints but have very important uh, agreements. So uh, again, great conversation. Be sure to check it out, share the show. Conflicts of Interest is on YouTube. Odyssey and Library for video versions is hosted at the Libertarian Institute. And uh, we're on all the podcatchers, social media at con underscore interest for Twitter. And there's Facebook and MeWe pages. Uh, the last way you can support the show is by supporting the sponsor of the show, and that is Paloma Verde. PalomaVerdeStore.com is where you go to get your CBD products. Uh, they're great to help you with minor pain, mental health. Uh, Will Porter enjoys the uh, the co-host of the show, typically enjoys uh, the CBD with melatonin ad strat. I like the topical creams. Uh, helps me with minor, like especially bad pain and inflammation. So uh, be sure to check it out, PalomaVerdeStore.com. Use the promo code PEACE. P-E-A-C-E for 25% off when you check out. Now let's get into the discussion. Welcome, everybody. Today we have a great discussion. Uh, our guest is Angela McArdle, from Calif who's speaking to us from California. Kelly Lane, co-hosting. Kyle Anzalone, co-hosting. And this is a swap cast between Around the Empire and Conflicts of Interest show. Welcome, Angela. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So we have, hold on, three, two, one. I don't know, Kyle and uh, Kelly, I'll edit this out, but maybe you guys just want to say hello too. Oh, okay. Hey everyone. Thanks for uh, putting this together, Joanne. All right, so we're gonna talk about three topics tonight. Uh, one being war and foreign policy, surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, well, we kind of, what we're all about and interventionism. We want to ask Angela how she feels about those topics and you know maybe some ways forward she sees to improve the situation. We're gonna talk about elections and election integrity and election reform, quote unquote reform in some cases, and also the handling of the pandemic and the lockdowns in particular and the effects of those. And then we have a bonus question at the end and that'll, that'll be the show. So to start off, Angela, if you would, just tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Sure. Um, I am the chair of the Libertarian Party of Los Angeles County. I'm very active in the liberty movement, uh, not just within the, the official Libertarian Party, but as far as issue coalitions go, anti-war, anti-lockdown, uh, Second Amendment rights, First Amendment rights, things of that nature. I'm also on the California Libertarian Party Executive Committee, and I am running to chair the National Party in 2022. So I spend a lot of time focused on liberty issues. That's great. So Kyle, should we just roll into the war? Do you wanna preface that in any way, war and foreign policy? Just for a little background, Kelly and I tend to come from the more progressive side of things, though we're disgruntled. Um, or maybe even ex-progressives, now independents. Uh, Kyle comes from the libertarian side of things. So it's kind of a good mix here. But um, Kyle, why don't you roll us into, you know, talking about our thoughts about war and foreign policy, interventionism and such. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the big thing with war and foreign policy is how important it is, of course, uh, when you look at the, just the amount of spending, the budget, maybe if you lump a bunch of entitlements together, that gets you, you know, a bigger social security welfare lump sum, but military is huge and uh, it really doesn't get talked about, or if it does, it gets talked about in this obscure way we have now uh, with Tucker Carlson, where, you know, should uh, females who are, what, seven months pregnant be able to fi fly fighter pilots and wear pilot suits, or is that... And, you know, that like that's a conversation we end up having on foreign policy. So 
uh, you know, how do we have a real conversation on foreign policy and actually, you know, talk about the the pregnant people were bombing rather than who's flying the, our fighter pilots and what they identify as? So maybe just roll into, you know, your thoughts on war and foreign policy as an elected representative, how you would, you would approach it. You're wearing two hats here, right? You'd like to be uh, a person in Congress. You also want to run a party and, um, you know, just give us our thoughts on if you had, let's say you're the head of the Nas Libertarian National Party, I would think you'd play a big role in setting the policy for the party, which I don't think would be a big surprise, but the party has been a little unpredictable lately. So, um, or, you know, if you want to look, approach it from the aspect of as an elected representative, how you would do it, we'd love to hear about that. Oh, sure. So you're right. The Libertarian Party at the national level has been a little bit all over the place for the past uh, four to six years, I'd say, maybe even stretching further back than that, if you wanted to look at it since the mid 2000s. The leadership has not been really consistent. We haven't necessarily been principally oriented towards freedom. Instead, the National Party tends to sort of chase the approval of mainstream culture. And that does not leave the, uh, the anti-war movement much room to, to breathe really in the national politics, because sadly we've seen, you know, no one seems to really care that much at the national level about the fact that we are still engaged in all of these wars of aggression across the across the country. So I'm sorry, across the globe, it's really, really disheartening. I think I think the Libertarian Party could play a really great role in facilitating the anti war movement and giving it some more dialogue at the national level. And one of the ways that I think that we should do that is probably by lending a stronger voice to to veterans because anti-war veterans are people who are here at home talking about their lived experiences. Um, I think that, that uh, liberals, progressives, second wave feminists got it right in the 1960s when they started championing the phrase, the personal is the political. Uh, it seems like there's a connection that's very strong between personal experience and political and social grassroots movements. Uh, you know, Rod Paul did an amazing thing when he got people to get really riled up about ending the Fed and being anti-war. And that was sort of still on the heels of the aftermath of all the September 11th tax and the wars for empire. But here we are 20 years later, still dealing with it. And a lot of the enthusiasm is sort of gone. But what has taken its place are a lot of shattered lives from people who have come back just totally broken from military service. And I think that something that the Libertarian Party and some of the smaller third parties as well could really do to help would be to start lending a voice and, you know, trying to push for them in media too. You know, alt media is really taking off. People are not paying so much attention to CNN and MSNBC anymore. At least people who are seeking the truth aren't. And so we should be there to really bridge that gap between veterans who are telling us how fruitless and, and damaging war is and people who are seeking the truth. Yes, and, and the, the anti-war movement, I mean, as you said, Joanne, we all come from a little bit slightly different backgrounds. You and I'm more from the progressive side, but this is an issue that people across the board agree on. Um, you know, ending, ending wars and all of the spending, um, the defense budget is more than anything else. And so I think this is an issue that the, the mainstream media continues to ignore because they know that this is something that unites people across the country that many people agree on. And it's, it's something we can work together to topple, topple the establishment narrative about it. Angela, that's a, a great point with, uh, you know, promoting the voice of, of veterans. Uh, I know there's like Dan Midnight with Bring Our Troops Home.us uh, that does pretty good work. And I, I think they would 
fall more on the libertarian side of things so maybe that's you know a group the libertarian party could work with i think they've worked with uh the 10th amendment center and uh i've talked uh with mike meharry about uh the bring our troop or not bring, uh defend our guard legislation that's uh about not deploying the national guard to undeclared wars and and stuff like that and so you know i think there is a, a lot of room for those voices and uh a need to promote them i've had a, a veteran on the show who started in the afghan war to talk about that and, you know, he's now an anti-war guy, Scott Spalding, and uh, finding a, a way, especially within the libertarian platform, to uh, to up these voices. I mean, uh, we all know, or at least all of us in the libertarian community know that Ron Paul got the most uh, donations from active duty military in 2012, uh, more than all the other candidates combined. And so the those voices are out there, and yet it, it seems rarely in the libertarian party do we end up uh, elevating them, uh, you know, think of a major libertarian that's you know and an, a veteran it's uh, uh adam uh correct koresh kokesh uh, i'm pretty kokesh. Sure. yeah kokesh <laughs> that's right i got there um yeah is, is one but there's not a ton so uh, that's something we could focus on yeah absolutely adam kokesh uh is a veteran so he's done a pretty good job at veteran outreach I just feel like they're a group of people that just get left on the sidelines in all of the political dialogue. And, and it's really disheartening because they're the ones that have the most powerful stories. Um, you know, and I know we'll probably chat about lockdowns later, but one of the things that I've done in California in our Libertarian Party is go and interview business owners who have been just decimated by, by the lockdowns, small business owners. I think we could do the same thing with veterans to really bring their voices to the forefront and get some of that stuff going viral. I imagine if someone organized them, progressive, libertarian or otherwise, into a strong voting block or a caucus within a party, you would start to see some things happen. Because even though the loudest, most progressive voices in the Democratic Party are still a minority, they still move the culture. They shift things, uh, just like the, the people on the furthest right did in the Republican Party under the Trump administration. So it's just a battle for the Overton window. And if we can give the anti-war movement a voice, I think that it'll start to be heard um, a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the issues where common ground seems to be easy to find. Now, I don't know how well you get people to get along for whatever project you decide to go on, as you mentioned, you know, a caucus, a movement, a coalition, um, I think it already happens informally. You can see right here, Kyle and I work together a lot. Uh, Kelly and I work together a lot. And these, it's mostly because of the common ground that we have found. Uh, and I am not one of those people who won't, won't work with someone who's outside of my political party or ideology. Certainly not anymore, maybe there was a time. But as Kelly mentioned, across the board, and I think this really scares the establishment, the support for wars are uh, very much dwindling. And you really have to wonder, you know, why the establishment is so fearful right now, particularly of, of the military. You have to wonder why Trump got such support from the military. The libertarian candidate in 2016, Gary, uh, his name's already, Gary Didn't Johnson. He, I remember reading polls of something like military.com or the Military Times or something where they estimated that he got a lot of votes out of the mm -hmm. military. And wasn't he taking an anti-interventionist stance to, to some yes, extent? Yes, definitely. So, yeah. And, and now we have this president who immediately puts a halt to any idea of uh, withdrawals that were already underway. Uh, talks that were underway or I and various throughout I mean the guy there's hard to find much good about that guy but it does look like he was going to pull some troops out right which uh, would be right. would be different and that was you're clearly not allowed to do that the pushback right. on that was just astounding right mm -hmm. we saw we saw Donald Trump you know present this fairly strong anti-war position for someone coming out of the Republican Party. And then we saw quite an about face on it uh, as his administration got full, filled full of people, you know, that we all probably refer to as the swamp. 
Um, and, and it seemed like there wasn't a really consistent perspective on that. It seemed like there was a lot of bickering and infighting and shuffling people around. Um, I'm, I, I feel personally that the powers that be did everything they could to keep wars going, even though they had a president who was inclined to get rid of them. Um, and who knows what all happens and what kind of political pressure that you're under once you get into the White House. I try to, you know, give, you know, I take everything with a grain of salt, I guess. Like, I, I'm not in the White House, you know, and I don't know what people are whispering in president's ears or what kind of threats or veiled threats they're making or what kind of gross compromises they have to come to. But I think that the, the incentives to keep our country in perpetual warfare are really strong. And that's something else that we should take into consideration when we're pushing back against the warfare state is just how deep the tentacles go. They're really deep. Well, regarding the, the anti-war movement, you know, on the, on the left, uh, I hate to use left right terms anymore, but on the, the Democrat side, um, I just recently, I've been working on a project um, with Assange Countdown to Freedom and it's uh, with Cornell West. And there's this, this piece of um, one of his speeches that we put in and it is so powerful because he starts talking about, you know, whether it's a life in Libya or a life in, you know, he's, he's listing off everywhere around the globe that we're dropping bombs and killing black and brown people. As he said, and the crowd you can hear, and this is a Bernie 2020 crowd and they are cheering even louder for those sections. So I think that there's just largely a, a bit of, um, I guess, denial or just people don't know. A lot of people that consume mainstream media, you know, MSNBC, they, they just aren't aware. They think, oh, we're, we're spreading democracy. But as the truth starts to come out through, you know, podcasts like Joanne and Kyle that cover, you know, foreign policy, people have to start, you know, they do start opening their eyes to what's really going on. And I think once they really know the truth, they are against it. They're just kind of still in the dark. So I think it's great. Like, and, and having the, the veterans come on and talk is extremely powerful. Um, that really gets the message across. But I think they're just, they're, they're right to like join that movement. They just haven't yet. Yes, yes. They are pre-anti-war yeah. uh, movement. That's what I'd call them. Yeah. Now, yeah. Angela, the, I'm sorry, Kyle, please go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention that, you know, Angela talked about how deep the tentacles are and how hard it is to end the wars. Uh, you know, we, we just found out what in the past day now that they actually have a thousand more troops in Afghanistan than they advertise. It's actually 3,500 and not uh, 2,500. They didn't weren't counting the special forces troops. And uh, th who knows that this is another example like Syria, where the officials will later come out and straight up admit that they were lying to Donald Trump and hiding the numbers from him like they were doing in Syria. Or if this was a case where uh, Trump knew it and was trying to deceive the numbers to continue to fight the Taliban uh, more you know i i guess that's unclear at this point but it's so hard and uh you know as kelly was saying trying to wake people up to this because you know i i think like two three quarters of veterans and two thirds of the overall american people support ending the wars in iraq and afghanistan and yet we can't get the the politicians to move on this i think part of it is they always come up with an excuse you know why is the right not the right time to leave and so whether it's tammy duckworth saying i want to bring the troops home i just don't want to bring them home in body bags or you know the republicans saying that well look what happened in 2011 we left iraq and then three years later we had to go back to defeat isis uh, that'll all always end up you know being kind of the spin that that keeps us in the war so it, it's so hard to fight against but uh go ahead joanne so i was just wondering the was it uh what year did was it 2008 that ron paul ran? yes and when he got some real traction and I, I you know the story that i hear from who people i find credible is it, it was just taken away it was rigged away from him yeah and yeah that, i believe that yeah. And I can remember seeing, you know, bridge overpasses, big, you know, either things painted or signs, Ron Paul revolution. And I was like, who is that guy? You know what? I don't even know what that's about. That was the beginning though of a, of a coalition. And I think there are bits of some of the same things have reappeared and pop kept popping up ever since then. Uh, you're, 
ideas, your vision for the Libertarian Party? I'm not sure if, if, if you will approach it as your personal vision or whether just I'm a good leader, you know, I'm going to get all of us together and we're going to together come uh, create a platform and, um, a, you know, a combined vision. But can some, what, what happened to that Ron Paul energy in the sure. political forum? And is that a direction that you would want to go? Absolutely. I mean, I want to see the Ron Paul Revolution 2.0 kick off within the Libertarian Party this time instead of the GOP. I feel that the Trump's populist movement sort of sucked all of the air out of the room in the GOP and has made it too difficult for a liberty revolution to take place within that party. Um, so I would like to make the Libertarian Party a more welcoming place for principled libertarians instead of just a, an internal party social club. And I would like to see the Ron Paul revolution, you know, sort of spread its wings again. Um, that's, that's really my vision for the LP is to make it, to make it a place for, for, for true libertarian activism again. And as far as like what happened to it, well, some of the energy was funneled into Young Americans for Liberty and some of the other offshoot organizations, there was, there was a really strong youth movement. So that sort of continued on, but it didn't necessarily stay as principled. So some of the candidates that Young Americans for Liberty supports are very principled, but some of them are not so much, you know, you get, um, in my opinion, what are just kind of typical GOP candidates. It's a real, it's a real grab bag of uh, principles within that organization. And, um, you know, eventually Ron Paul, you know, he was no longer in office. And so his group kind of became, you know, leaderless. And so they're sort of out there, but they're not necessarily oriented towards a particular action. Uh, and I'd, I'd really like to fix that. You know, I think that everything that he spoke about with the remnant is really, it's, it's very poignant and it's very, um, it's very timely. So Ron Paul tells the story of the, the remnant that he, that he pulled from a short story called Isaiah's Job. It's from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah in the Old Testament. And it's that, you know, God goes to the prophet Isaiah and says, okay, I want you to go out and I want you to preach to the people around you and tell them how bad they've got it and how everything is just going to hell and things are a disaster. And if they don't turn back now, you know, they're just doomed forever. And Isaiah says, well, okay, you know, and then God reminds him, and by the way, they're not going to listen to you and it's going to be terrible and they're going to ridicule you and hate you and threaten you. And then Isaiah says, well, that sounds like a pretty bad time. Why would I do that? That sounds totally pointless. And God says, well, you don't understand. You're preaching to them, but you're not really preaching for them. Your job is to go out and preach this message so that the people around you who do care, who are still principled, the remnant, so that they hear you and take heart and are encouraged. Your job is to build them up so that when everything else just burns down and civilization collapses, you guys can rebuild. And I want that to be what the Libertarian Party and the Liberty Movement at large does for the country. You know, like whatever we're dealing with, lockdowns, devastating wars abroad, fiscal policy that's just, you know, basically debt enslavement to our children. I think that we need to really develop and cultivate a core group of us who care very much about the future. Um, you know, and I want it to be the Libertarian Party, but I want it to be bigger than that because the whole point of the LP is to make the world a freer place. You know, it's not just to make us freer in our own lifetimes. It, it's to make the world a freer place for everyone. So that's, you know, that's my vision for the LP. And it's how I'd also like to, to rein in what's left of the Ron Paul revolution. Interesting. Well, the, the parallels there with just listening to you talk about all that, the parallels with the Bernie Sanders movement and the Democratic Party are, are kind of, shocking i mean really it, it if you could get those groups together even though we know there are issues um i'd love to ask you a little bit about health care because i think that's one of the big ones where progressives will say dem exiters former bernie people um don't agree you know with libertarians on but if you could take those two groups i mean 
that that's that's the majority of the country right there and could really get yeah. something done and i i find a lot of those people that don't think in the two party terms they also are a lot more open minded about working with other people like you said Joanne that don't think exactly like you do or don't have everything the same that you're not they're not afraid to work with others but we have to acknowledge that there are those issues where we don't see eye to eye like healthcare so i'd, I'd love to, if you want to elaborate on that at all i don't want to steer too far off from foreign policy here joanne and kyle but i would i would love to know what you know what where can we find that common ground between x or whatever progressives and libertarians when it comes to certain things like health care i think we should work on single issue coalitions very much and i think that if libertarians and progressives want to work on healthcare reform, one of the ways they can do it is to actively seek out uh, regulatory capture that they both don't agree with and change it. So if insurance companies are getting special kickbacks, if they are incentivized to, to cheat people or be dishonest, we can hone in on those things and try to change them. And that may be a small section, but it might be a very, very powerful section of laws and, and regulations as well. Um, and, you know, like that's, it's, that's how I think you can form coalitions on anything is you might think, okay, it's too broad of a divide, we'll never get there. But if you just dig deep enough, you can usually find something, even if it's fairly narrow in scope. And mm -hmm. the more narrow in scope something is, usually the easier it is to work on. So that's one thing I'd recommend, uh, you know, libertarians do not like corporatism. We don't, we don't like special interest cronyism. And I'm sure that uh, Bernie supporters and progressives would agree on that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So kind of going in a yeah, more narrow focus makes sense because I think the the discussion tends to be just, oh, we're for Medicare for all and libertarians are not. And, and people don't talk past that. So that, that yeah, great, great information there. Keep that. Keep that in mind. Yeah, and you and you can you can use a broader concept to keep keep you know to glue it together too. Something like anti-corruption, mm -hmm. uh, something yeah. like you know people people should be have access to health care. I mean, there are certain yeah. things we certainly would agree on how to get there, the solutions. That's where we start to crack crack up. But I you know I think we can all see the direction that things are going in and agree that this isn't, you know, this isn't the way we want things to go. Um, looking at the time, does this seem like a, a you know, pre, please bring up anything else on the war and foreign policy topic too, but it seems like a good time to sort of roll into elections since we brought up the, we're on the Bernie and the Ron Paul uh, subject a little bit. And um, uh, everybody wanna move to the next topic? Yeah, okay. So this time we want to talk about, we can frame it within the 2020 election. We can talk about that. The issue of election integrity, I think that uh, to differing degrees or maybe for different reasons, I think we all have some serious issues with what we saw going on in the 2020 election and in what we were not allowed to see, though what we were denied by courts and other officials and things like that. And even more disconcerting, and the reason why today is a good time to talk about it is that the House passed uh, their very first bill is something called HR1. And it has another Orwellian name. Um, what is it called again? <laughs> the, oh gosh, now I'm gonna for, forget that Orwellian name. I know I've got it here in, the People's Act, yeah, the People's Act, and they call it a democracy reform. It's an 800 page bill and it has some big changes into it that take that seem to centralize the, at least the regulation of elections, the running of elections, I guess is still done locally, but uh, there's a lot of uproar about it, but it has passed the house and now the Senate it uh, is gonna take it up in a hearing, I believe next week. And it's just makes me uncomfortable that in such a short period of time, when the people who were just elected in an election that had, um, seems to have had some really big problems are gonna roll right in and change all the rules for elections. That just seems like um, 
you know, everyone's greatest fear and has things historians talk about, like, you know, of course, if you're, if you're, if you're going to sort of cheat in some way or manipulate in some way, get yourself in power and then change the rules. Okay. Mm, we, you know, we gotta, we gotta talk about this. Anybody yeah. else? I didn't explain that very well. Maybe you guys want to chip in on that. Well, it's an 800 page bill. I don't know how well any of us could possibly explain it in a short period of time. I, yeah. I've looked into it. The, the first thing that, that I find disconcerting is when I try to Google it or, you know, look it up on a major search engine, I'd only get opinion pieces. I don't get even excerpts of the bill. So that disturbs me. I'm like, what are they trying to hide? Why do they not want me to know what it is? And it's like half of the articles are talking about how uh, there was no election fraud. Okay, well, what does that have to do with the bill? So that disturbed me to no end. Um, and it just seems like another centralization of power. It just seems like a power grab to me. I'm very active in you know, local politics, I guess, maybe state level politics. So what I mean by that is I, I've run for Congress twice. So I've spent a good chunk of time down at the local, uh, it's called the Registrar Recorder's Office in California, uh, filling out election forms and, and turning them in and getting signatures. And I'm pretty familiar with how it works and I've helped at least half a dozen other candidates through the process, you know, handholding. California has some really, uh, really particular tight, tight, I guess, straight laced laws on how to do things, but they're unique to California, right? Um, I don't know that it's a good idea that we should make all 50 states have the same election rules. California's rules are sort of tailored to California. Do I think they're sort of cronyist and, you know, onerous and difficult? I do. But I don't think that that's the case in every every state. Um, and you know, people have different demographics. There are some counties that are more electronically savvy than others. There are places that insist on doing things by hand. There are places that have tried to implement electronic voting and it has been absolutely just like cast out and people have said, we don't want that here. And they would rather deal with with paper ballots. And I really do think that we need to leave that up to, to the individuals. If people are concerned about election fraud, they should be the ones who are able to decide how their elections are run, I would think. Definitely, from my point of view, for sure. I think and we need a strong candidate coalition. I say independent candidate coalition, whether you're a Green, a Dem, a Libertarian, whatever, but an independent coalition fighting for election integrity. And I think that includes uh, changing these machines or, you know, insisting on, on, on machines that aren't a black box uh, as they yeah. say in that, in that community, the activist community. Um, but what you said about the, uh, you know, there, there was no election fraud. I witnessed it myself in election security groups that are largely any blue will do is what I call them. Um, of basically saying, shh, like, don't say anything now. Like, all that stuff where, you know, there's like funny business with the elections. No, it's fine right now because they wanted Trump out. And it was very alarming to me because I think if we don't have free and fair elections, I mean, obviously we don't have democracy. I'm of the opinion, I don't, if it's even the person I don't want to win, I, I, I want it to be real. So um, yeah, I think that we need candidates to get behind something that is more transparent um, and not, and yes, I think having a nationalized um, election system is kind of a scary prospect, again, if it's not transparent. So leaving it up to the states is probably a safer bet at this point. But we could have a uniform system as long as it was like built to specs of, of a guy, John Papa, that you've spoken with before, Joanne, um, on your um your chat with Around the Empire. He's uh, He works in IT security and he's built a system that is basically unhackable, if you will. Um, you know, it's transparent at each step. And I think you're right, these, the, subject, the subject is so huge that people just, you gotta read this like 100 page bill or whatever, it's confusing and we need to simplify it for the public, but have candidates get behind something, you know, 
on the same message about it, I think would be very helpful. There yeah. are African countries that have started doing blockchain voting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to try to make them election uh, tamper proof. I think Zimbabwe might have. It's, it's really surprising where some of these technologies come from. You're like, Zimbabwe elections? That seems mm -hmm. like they would, wouldn't they be like more corrupt than the United States? But ooh, after mm -hmm. the last uh, two election cycles, I, I'm not putting us up, the, up at the top of, uh, you know, no. elections that have a lot of integrity in them. I, I, sadly, I don't think so. No. So, uh, you know, one thing I, I've picked up on in the past couple of weeks is not only at the national level, but the state level, it seems like there's a lot of action going on with voter laws. Um, Republicans trying to make it uh, at, at times just seemingly more difficult to vote, like trying to make uh, early voting on weekends in particular impossible, or uh, Democrats trying to make it so that like any paper that shows up at the voting center is going to be counted. And uh, I was thinking, and I heard uh, Crystal and Sager on the Morning Rising team, and they always have interesting things to say. I don't know if I agree, but they said that the next uh, few years, there would be like a, a real uh, kind of battle going on to change the voter laws. And I was thinking that's probably going to really hurt the third parties. I don't know if it'll be intentional within the laws or not, but just, I know the Libertarian Party spends an awful lot of money just trying to keep it, uh, you know, on the ballot in all the states. Uh, and that's a, a pretty expensive task. And so I'm guessing that'll make it harder. It'll probably be more difficult for the Green Party that's a little bit smaller and isn't on the ballot in all these states. And I'm sure for local, uh, you know, local levels, if you're not a Republican or a Democrat and you don't have, you know, access to like their connections to the system, suddenly things are going to get a lot harder uh, to, to run for office. And so I, I think that's should be a real concern for all of us. That's a good point. Um, yeah, ballot access is a real is a real pain. It's really ridiculous. And some states make it harder and harder. Mm -hmm. Indiana tried to pass some nonsense bill to keep third parties out by dramatically increasing the signature requirements to get on the ballot. Uh, it failed. They got really freaked out because the rainwater campaign for governor did pretty well. And Iowa is now passing a bill to increase, I think, the signatures that you need to run at a state level or a gubernatorial level to like 5,000 plus. It's, it's ridiculous amount of work to knock people's doors, especially now that people are gripped in fear from, you know, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, another thing that this could potentially impact that I didn't think about until now is peeps, there are certain states and uh, areas that have adopted rate choice voting and different voting styles in order to, you know, try to sort some of this mess out and make people feel a little bit more satisfied. So I can't imagine how the federal law is going to, I, I, I mean, maybe there's a workaround, but I could see it making that difficult or also making it harder to, you know, change the way that you vote in the future ranked choice voting, star voting, there are a couple of other formats, you know, and obviously you know, I'm in favor of anything that's gonna help people feel a little bit better, you know, about their conscience when they cast their ballot. I did come across an, a statement from, I guess it's an article from the Green Party on their website about HR1. And what they're saying is that, they're saying that there are several poison pills for democracy and for opposition parties like the Green Party in this bill, they're saying, I'll just read a couple of bullet points I got here. HR one quintuples the amount of money green presidential campaigns, and that would mean all third party uh, campaigns will be required to raise for, to qualify for federal matching funds from $5,000 in each of 20 states to $25,000 per state. Uh, and then they say it undermines everyone's right to organize electorally against the parties of war and Wall Street. In a recent Gallup poll, a record 62% of US voters said that we need a new major party. So they're just sort of talking about the importance of third parties. Then they say um, it abolishes the general election campaign block grants that parties can access by winning at least 5% of the vote in the previous presidential election. And HR1 would eliminate this provision that was created to give a fair shot to alternative parties that demonstrate significant public support. And then they say that 
It replaces the general election block grants where each qualified candidate receives a set lump sum of public funding for campaign expenses. And they replace it with matching funds through election day, a huge step backwards for public campaign finance report reform. Uh, using the above mentioned criteria designed to squeeze out alternative parties and independent candidates. And there's two more bullet points. And then it says eliminate the limits on donations and expenditures candidates can receive and make. So that's another thing that apparently is in this bill, which I haven't read the 800 pages myself. And then one last thing, it says it inflates the amount of money that national committees can give to candidates from 5,000 to 100 million. That's quite a jump. Um, an astonishing increase of what, how many, there's no commas here. Uh, it looks to me to be about 2 million percent that would give party bosses virtually unlimited power to flood elections with big money. So that's just some of the things they picked out. The, uh, the Democrats frame it as sort of the, mo the, the most important democracy reform to protect our elections since the Civil Rights Act. They compare it to the Civil Rights uh, Voting Act. And, they, and there's an article in Mother Jones, which is a completely co-opted uh, media outlet right now, by the way, they say that it be it, it expands automatic registration and two week early voting across all 50 states. It beefs up mail in voting, which is one of the things that was most problematic. Uh, well, well known across the world, it, it is has high potential for fraud. And um, they say Mother Jones resident wrote, voting rights expert, Ari Berman, says, quote, it's really the most significant democracy reform bill since the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. And then their talk about HR1, the People's Act, and they also talk about another uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Um, they, they would actually have both of those things, what they say to safeguard voting rights. And then coming from the, the more right-wing outlets, you hear things like um, that the Democrats feel an urgency to do this because Republican majorities in state legislatures are passing legislation bills in swing states that are aimed at tightening election laws based on the things they saw happening in the 2020 election. The ACLU said that it would set up an automatic voter registration in states that do not currently allow it, uh, then it would also prevent a state from significantly limiting early voting. Um, I think it makes it more difficult to clean up voter rolls, which, you know, sometimes that's done for legit reasons. Every day that thing becomes, you know, more out of date because things change. But I think it's also been abused, at least we suspect it has, but Anyway, they're, they're messing with that. And it says that it sets national standards for elections that by requiring states to have election day voter registration, so on the spot registration as well, early voting days for 15 days, limits the money in politics and ends partisan gerrymandering. Good luck with that. Um, and establishes new ethics rules too. So they, uh, there are, there's a Fox News article where they're saying it's the it's an 800 page monstrosity that it would usurp the role of the states, the most dangerous and irresponsible election bill this person has ever seen in an opinion piece. Um, it'll interfere with the ability of states and their citizens to determine the qualifications and eligibility of voters and to be able to ensure the accuracy and validity of the voter registration rolls, um, that it eliminates basic safety protocols a mandates new reckless rules and procedures. It eviscerates state voter ID laws that require a voter to authenticate his identity. And um, as a, it makes it harder to, to manage the voter registration rolls. What else is in here? Uh, oh, onerous new regulatory restrictions on political speech and activity, including online and policy related speech by candidates, citizens, civic rights groups, unions, corporations, and nonprofit organizations. 
which I don't, I, I'd like to know more about that. Um, yeah, I haven't heard that. Um, yeah. Joanne, I wanted to mention if anyone listening is more interested in this because election stuff gets kind of very dry and boring. Um, Lulu Freistat and Benny Smith have been doing live streams on Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. It's under Smart Elections. And they were both very active in um, and instrumental in Tim Canova's campaign um, or, and what all happened in 2016 um, and then 2018 also in his race. But I found that they've been some of the few um, that really strive to be nonpartisan, even though I know that they both lean progressive. Um, you know, Lulu's a journalist, sticks to the facts. Benny is just very, you know, he's an IT guy and he's also on a board of elections and I think it's Memphis, Tennessee. Um, but they had Howie Hawkins on recently to talk about how HR1 was affecting uh, Green parties. And I haven't had a chance to listen to the whole thing yet, but um, I think they, they really do try to do a good job of looking and, and, and they had a, um, a Republican election attorney on too, which I was shocked because about, because normally that um, activist group does not talk to Republicans. So I thought that was good of them to do that. I mean, if we're gonna tackle this, it isn't a partisan issue. So, you know. So I guess like Angela and you, uh, from your perspective, it looks like, uh, assuming that the Green Party's take on it, it looks like it's, yeah, and this doesn't surprise me, gonna make it much more difficult for third party to ever rise other than being this symbolic thing that you can cast a few ballots, uh, you can cast your ballot for if you're really pissed off at the, but it, it just props up the, the two party duopoly at a time when, well, I mean, we always need other options, uh, third parties and such, but at a time when I think we particularly need it. So um, this is probably not news to you uh, you've probably seen this kind of thing before, but may, I don't know, maybe you have some thoughts on that as well. I think it's really disgusting that they would compare this election, quote unquote, reform to the Civil Rights Act. Um, that really, it really grosses me out to, that they think that the, what they're doing right now is, is akin to giving, you know, Black people voting rights. That really makes me gag. Uh, I think it's interesting how they, you know, they they want to raise the bar for us to participate as third parties, make it more difficult. And then at the same time, they give themselves like even more money to dump into election funds. But we get pushed out of that. We don't we don't get that opportunity, uh, which that is also, you know, really vile behavior. Uh, libertarians are, you know, like we want as few laws as possible. We would like as, you know, ideally as few uh, election laws as, as possible when it comes to like financing. But the way that they've tooled this, like, you know, you, you can't support when they, they're like, yeah, we'll take all of the money except you don't get to play. Um, so I imagine that you'll probably hear people, you know, trying to compare this people on the right compare it to citizens united or something or maybe the left will say you know you got citizens united why can't we get this that sort of it's just sort of like the pendulum swinging back and forth back and forth um of corruption mm -hmm. uh, people are just not they're not thinking critically about this kind of stuff uh, you know i hope that it doesn't pass i would encourage people obviously to write your senators and and lean on, uh, you know, do a little bit of research and see if there are lobbying groups who would be willing to fight against this and try to try to be inventive about who you reach out to speak to your senators on your behalf, because uh, it's not good. I'm hoping that Republicans will strike it down. Um, I guess I guess we'll see. The House is pretty split. Yeah, so, most I mean, people seem to be saying that they don't think that it's going to make it through the Senate intact because it'll get, they, they won't be able to get 10 votes for the cloture vote to pass the cloture. Then yeah. they say, well, they're gonna blow up the filibuster. And this is a perennial thing. We hear this a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of times, um, but I guess it's to me, uh, not to you personally, but I'm really disappointed in the libertarian movement for, for example, on this election, 
on these proposed reforms, on the great reset kind of thing and the pandemic and lockdowns. Like I thought they would be some of the biggest, strongest voices on these issues. It goes to the core of what you guys are about, seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And like, I would have hoped that you, I hate to say you, because it's not you personally, but the group. this movement, this movement would have been the ones that we would hope to rely on in moments like this. Yeah. Not that we don't all have responsibility to do those kinds of things, but like what happened? Uh, I'm confused. Well, what happened was you have a group of people who are they, the classic uh, bad trope of fiscally conservative, socially liberal, who have taken over the Libertarian Party and uh, they're not very principled. So what you see them doing instead of putting liberty at the forefront is chasing after the culture. And right now the culture is sort of like wokeism, social justice warrioring, being, being offended easily and being afraid to speak out. Um, and that's not a good place to be. So instead of being oriented towards liberty, we, the Libertarian Party has a little bit of a self-esteem issue. And so it's afraid to sort of speak out and put liberty at the forefront. Instead, we go around saying things like, oh, we want the same thing. We just uh, want to achieve it differently. But as we could see over the last year, some of us do not want the same things. I want to be free. I don't want to be locked in my home. Uh, and that's something that the Libertarian Party should be putting at the forefront of its messaging. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I think about liberty, one of the first things I think about is whether or not I'm imprisoned. And most of us have been put on house arrest for a year, the better part of a year, if, especially if you're in a very, uh, very blue state like I am in California. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you. The Libertarian Party itself has not done well on this at all it's been it's been an embarrassment uh which is why i'm running for national chair now, i will give credit to some of the libertarian uh talking heads and people who are the movers and shakers in the party but not official party members so the ron paul institute has done a great job the mises institute tom woods uh dave smith uh you know michael malice who's more of an anarchist uh, those people have spoken out really strongly against lockdowns and you know all of the other status quo garbage that has been thrown at us so i would like to see the libertarian party do the same thing and actually be oriented towards freedom not uh pandering and and begging for people to like us on social media because when you when you abandon your principles and beg people to like you what ends up happening is that no one likes you very well said wow Great point. I was just gonna add, a year ago. I mean, I remember the internet was plastered with articles. There are no libertarians in a pandemic. And I feel like the Libertarian National Party kind of read that and said, okay, we're gonna say, oh, well, it's voluntarily okay. So any, you know, it's all private business that's doing this. So if, you know, you go into a private business, then they get to say whether you wear a mask and have to social distance and everything. So they, they I think, really got bullied into this, uh, you know, shut up. There are no libertarians during a pandemic. You people are supposed to be quiet right now. This is the time where big government needs to save everyone. And I, I mean, a, a year later, I think uh, everybody should, you know, has a, a good idea of why they should be a libertarian, why the government shouldn't have the power to lock people in their homes in the first place, because they're going to abuse the hell out of it and they're going to make it last as absolutely long as possible. I mean, now it, it's to the point where when a state starts to open up and reduce some of the COVID regulations, they actively root for that state to turn into, you know, a, a catastrophe and a crisis that, you know, they, they should be like, oh, wow, if Florida could open up, maybe that means our state could open up. You know, if Florida opens up, it's, oh, that state's going to turn into hell. And, and even when it doesn't, they don't say, oh, maybe we could reconsider our uh you know policies now and so they just got lucky or this other factor and this factor and that factor and, and they they just downplayed and it, it seems like they're really going to try to get these lockdowns to go on I, I don't know how long i'm really curious if there are any of uh, amongst the, the the louder more vocal libertarian voices out there against the lockdown 
Do they focus much on the fact that the, um, the IFR, the infection fatality rate is really low? Um, that's something I've brought up before I've posted it on Facebook and, you know, I'm not a, I mean, I believe the virus is real. I understand how many people have died, but when you start digging in and looking at the, by age group, it's something they never report on is that, oh, there are this many deaths and boy, do you have to spend hours digging to try to find out, well, are, I mean, are these 12 year olds? I mean, what, what, how serious is this really? And I'm not to say elderly people don't matter, but are the, all these deaths in the nursing home and it's just one aspect of this whole thing that I found um, would have helped calm some of the panic. Not that we didn't need to protect people that were vulnerable, but just that the infection fatality rate is very low. Maybe not some of the more recent uh, strains, the UK version, I guess is worse, but anyway, do you guys know? Um, oh yeah, um, Tom Woods covered that really well in several podcast episodes he's got resources on his website i think it's tomwoods.com mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um and he's interviewed some some heretical epidemiologists like uh professor Mal martin koldorf who who and the, he's a progressive he's from the left but he's he's just not crazy you know he's got integrity and he said absolutely like this is this makes no sense it's mm -hmm. absolute nonsense you know the the mainstream media are, are are being dishonest about all of the statistics. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I definitely recommend that you would check out Tom Wood's uh, website for anything mm -hmm. related to the, the any statistical stuff related to the, the pandemic is mm -hmm. really fantastic. I will. Um, the Mises that. Institute too. Okay, but as you said, you know, the wokeism, it's, it's amazing how powerful that is to shut down any discussion. Like, like I just said, I feel like I have to preface it with like, I believe it's a real virus. I'm not like, you know, I'm not in right. that, but I'm just asking questions about the real, like, you know, danger yeah. here. And, but you, I mean, in certain circles, you even bring it up, you're shut down immediately. So um, yeah, I'm glad to hear there are more voices. I just, I don't hear a lot of it. Um, there's just a lot of misinformation out there too. So it's hard to weed through. But, I would also yeah. think that the, the World Economic Forum's infamous video, uh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. <laughs> you know, all these unelected people uh, with this vague plan that saying like, no one's gonna own anything anymore. I, I expect you guys, I, that was Klaus Schwab, yeah. Do you, um, I expect the Libertarian Party to go after that one like gangbusters. Yeah, so they're not um, going to own anything either. The, the, right. the top, right, okay, right. Oh well, if I'm elected chair of the National Party next year, I will be going after that hardcore. Um, young people don't quite understand, you know, and it's partly because we've been burdened with inflation that they don't understand what an egregious violation it is to say that you're going to own nothing because they think, well, I don't own anything now. Uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I need help. I'm in this situation. I'm in that situation. I can't imagine it, but you don't want to be in a position where you're retiring and you haven't been able to accumulate anything to take care of yourself. Uh, that's not, that's not a position we need to, we want anyone to be in, you know, when people are retiring, they should be able to have a modest, you know, a small piece of property. I don't think that that's uh, controversial for any political organization, you know, to say that I should be able to own my own home, uh, have a retirement account. And it is extremely disturbing to think that, uh, you know, like the world's uh, elites, the wealthiest people, the wealthiest people in the world don't want me to own like a one bedroom house. Like I don't, I don't deserve to own the, the place that I live if I work hard and try to pay for it my whole life. Super disgusting and really sinister. Uh, we should definitely be going after that, I think. Uh, and that would be a great issue coalition too, because even people who are, who are pretty far left progressive, they don't want the world's elites uh, planning our lives. I know they're not about that. 
It yeah. seems like a, a perfect system for absolute control if you don't own anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I, I mean, how many Americans are absolutely hostage to the uh, uh, what ban on evictions and foreclosures? I mean, if that goes away, there's a lot of people that are at least saying that they're in the position that they're going to be homeless. I mean, that makes you hostage to the politicians that have that policy in place, especially when they're the ones also preventing you from earning an income. So if they're not going to let you go out and work a job, Job, and then they're going to say, you know, the only thing keeping you in your house is this uh, eviction moratorium that we're only going to spend a couple months at a time. It keeps everybody uh, nice and, you know, in line with, oh, this politician is what's saving me from being homeless and mm -hmm. conditioning and fear and stuff is absolutely insane. So it's a really important point. Well, one of the worst things that happened during the lockdowns is that it shut down the opportunities a lot of us had to go out and talk about politics in person with our friends and our and our family members so i could imagine you know they basically they shut down everything that was public and they shut down everything that they owned so if they could also shut down our homes because we don't own them that's a really frightening thought we need to be able to protect uh, our spaces i mean we've we've seen how how difficult it has been to engage in political discourse on you know, traditional social media outlets. So I would like to at least protect the ability to do that in my own home. Well, you know, one thing I appreciate from what I've seen from your Twitter account, um, Angela, is that um, you're, you have some courage that I don't see from other people. You know, you're able to speak about it. And I really appreciate that. And I know we need to wrap up. So, um, uh, for you to tell us where to find your work and how to support you and how to keep in contact, um, read your stuff and, and all of that. Thank you so much for having me on. For anyone who's interested in following my chair race uh, for the Libertarian National Party in 2022, you can go to AngelaMcArdle.com. Uh, if you're interested in getting some uh, resources to grow a local anti-lockdown movement too, you can contact me there as well. I'm happy to share with you uh, the information I have, how I set up mailing lists, uh, CRM, all of those things so that you can help to keep track of your movement. If you're interested in joining the Libertarian Party in Los Angeles County, you can visit our website lplac.us and you can see what it's like to have principled activism uh, happening in your local community. Okay, well, I think that's it. It was great talking to everybody and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.